This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. everybody, I'm Mike Rabo. Thanks for coming this evening. Um, obviously with this uh, small group, I'm really looking forward to as much conversation as you're interested in. So um, I have prepared remarks, but please don't hesitate to interrupt with questions and comments as we go through. Um, and uh, of course at the end there'll be more time for, for questions and, and further discussion then. So I'm going to be talking about palliative care from the perspective of uh, its utility and role in patients who are dealing with genital urinary cancers. And I'm going to run through really what the definition of palliative care is, a way for all of us to think about it, um, what the needs are for palliative care, why we need palliative care, um, what the evidence says are the benefits of palliative care, why palliative care is a good thing for patients with GU cancers, and then a little bit of discussion about what the availability of palliative care is uh, once I've convinced you that it's a good thing that patients with GU cancers need it. Um, can they actually get it? Do we have enough palliative care across the country? So let's start though with the definition. So there's a boy at the blackboard and he's done a math problem incorrectly and he says, it may be wrong but it's how I feel. And I think this is a, a good summary for how many people think about palliative care. Um, people, some of them, have heard the term and insist that they know what it means, but many people don't. So I'm going to spend some amount of time talking about what palliative care really is, what the definition of palliative care is, and how we can distinguish it from other things that people often confuse it with. So we have a little bit of uh, research that was done on this question of how do Americans understand the term palliative care. So it was a study done, representative sample across the country, uh, people of all different ethnicities and political persuasions were asked uh, how they understood the term palliative care and if they understood what palliative care meant. There were a small number of folks who said that they were knowledgeable or very knowledgeable about palliative care, about 8%. And I'd say the rest of the country really didn't know what palliative care meant. Um, a few said that they didn't know what it was. Um, most said that they weren't at all knowledgeable about palliative care. There's a small percent that said that they were somewhat knowledgeable, which I think just meant that they didn't really want to admit that they didn't know. So I sort of think of this as the vast majority of Americans really don't know what the term palliative care is. Such a great marketing opportunity, as they would say in the advertising world. People don't know what it is that you do, so you get to define it for them. And in fact, it is a great marketing opportunity because what we know from that research study as well is that once people learn what palliative care is, the vast majority are extremely positive about it. So that more than 92% of people, once they understand what palliative care is, say that it's important that people with serious illness and their families should be educated about palliative care and they'd be likely to consider palliative care for a loved one. Um, and that it's important for palliative care services to be made available at all hospitals. This was the question that they were concerned with when they did the survey was palliative care in hospitals. Of course, most of us spend most of our time outside of hospitals, so in fact, thinking about outpatient palliative care is really my focus. This study did a lot of focus groups with the people they interviewed and came up with a definition that they found that most Americans were comfortable with. So this is a good working definition for palliative care. So I want to run through it with you. Palliative care is specialized medical care. So the idea that palliative care is a specialty is very attractive to people. 
In fact, you have to go through training, fellowship training, and other kinds of training to become a specialist in palliative care. It's for people with serious illness. People are comfortable with the term serious illness rather than advanced illness or terminal illness. Serious illness is something that you can do something about, and palliative care has a role there. This type of care is focused on providing patients with relief from the symptoms, pain, and stress of serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. So I'll focus you on the term stress. We used to, in the field, talk a lot about suffering, only to learn through research like this, focus groups with patients and families, that no one likes the term suffering. People really like to avoid suffering, even the word, at all costs. So we use the word stress, typically, um, to not uh, upset folks who are trying to understand how palliative care might serve them. Serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. So palliative care is not just for cancer care. That's the focus of our talk today. But palliative care is really available to people, whatever the illness they are facing, um, if it is a serious illness. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. We're really serving the whole patient, their whole life, and all the people who are important to them. Palliative care is provided by a team of doctors, nurses, and other specialists. So this idea that palliative care is working within a team is important to people who are working with a patient's other doctors to provide an extra layer of support. So the idea that palliative care is coordinated with other people in the healthcare system coordinated with oncologists and surgeons who are treating GU cancer is really important. And lastly, this term, an extra layer of support. If you remember one element of the definition of palliative care, it's probably that, that palliative care is providing this extra layer of support. Americans love this idea, right? We like the idea of having something extra, of getting more. In fact, that's what palliative care really provides, is an extra layer of support on top of the curative attempts that are being uh, pursued with your oncologist, with your radiation oncologist, with your surgeon. Palliative care is appropriate at any age and at any stage in a serious illness and can be provided together with curative treatment. So this idea that palliative care is on top of, is extra, is in addition to curative attempts. You don't have to give up the fight against your cancer to receive the benefits of palliative care. It's an extra layer of support. So we can break that down into some of the specifics about what palliative care is doing. It's really comprehensive care focused on the relief of symptoms and suffering or stress, as we just learned. Yeah. So we focus in the biological domain, thinking about physical symptoms like pain or dyspnea, shortness of breath constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, nutrition, and hydration. So focusing on the physical body and the symptoms patients suffer. The psychological or emotional symptoms of facing serious illness, depression, anxiety, fatigue, agitation, delirium. The social impacts of cancer on family caregiving, on people's finances, on their interpersonal relationships with their loved ones. And ultimately, cancer is often a spiritual journey as well. And palliative care can attend to these issues of spiritual well-being or spiritual growth or spiritual crisis, existential me meaning, and, and ultimately closure when people are facing the end of life. So we're focused on symptoms in all the different domains of human existence, and also focused on aligning care with the patient's preferences really making sure that patients are getting the kind of care that they want consistent with the goals that they have. So we think about advanced care planning, advanced directives where you can appoint someone as a surrogate decision maker or a DPOA. The POST form is a physician order for life-sustaining treatments, another opportunity to create an advanced directive to make sure your wishes are honored, even if you're not able to speak them yourself helping people with finances, doing legacy work, um, leaving memories, words, advice for generations to follow, um, and allowing people assistance with leave taking, with saying goodbye to loved ones at the end of their life. Ultimately, communication is the most important tool for palliative care, really helping people understand or define what quality of life, QL, means to them. 
What is a life worth living to you? Helping people with decision making and ultimately perhaps reconciling with relationships that are estranged in their life. So a slide about what palliative care is not. As I said before, palliative care is not for cancer only, for any serious illness that people are facing. It's not for people who are elderly, people at any age, at any stage in their illness. It's not necessarily end-of-life care. And importantly, it's not the same thing as hospice. And that's probably what most people confuse palliative care with most commonly. So if you look at sort of the Venn diagram, you can see palliative care is this big focus on relief of symptoms and decision making on good communication for people with serious illness. No matter what else you're doing, no matter what else you're trying to do or what other goals of care you have besides or in addition to your comfort. At the end of life, though, your care may really collapse down to a focus of palliative care only, meaning you're no longer pursuing curative attempts. And the entire focus of your care is palliative. The entire focus of your care is really focused on symptom management. Hospice is one particular type of end-of-life care in the United States. Hospice is a common type of very, very end-of-life care, typically in the last weeks of life, typically for people with cancer, although people dying of anything can get hospice care. But hospice care is an example of one type of end-of-life care, which is a part of what palliative care can do for people with serious illness. But again, the vast majority of palliative care really is focused on helping people manage their illness and their fight against their illness throughout the course of their clinical care. So we come to the term both and, this idea that palliative care is not an either or. Hospice is well known to be an either or proposition. You're sort of either in hospice or you're fighting against your cancer. Once you stop chemotherapy, hospice may be appropriate for you. Palliative care is not the same thing. Palliative care goes along with disease-directed therapies, concurrent with those, concurrent with attempts to cure the disease or control the disease, we can focus on palliative care. And the proportion of energy and time that's spent on trying to cure the disease versus palliate the symptoms of the disease may vary. At the very beginning, most people are entirely focused. At the very beginning of their disease, almost everybody is entirely focused on, what do I need to do to beat this thing? What do I need to do to cure my cancer? And so your focus is almost entirely on disease-directed therapies. But quite early on, it may be appropriate to focus as well on palliative care. Focus on your symptoms, on living as well as you can with the disease and the treatment that you have before you. So these things will vary in proportion over time. But ultimately, if our medical therapies fail patients, and ultimately the disease is not controllable with our treatments, what we are left with is palliative care alone, palliative care in isolation. Ultimately, at the very end, most patients are receiving palliative care only. And in that situation, hospice is a great mechanism to deliver palliative care. And of course, palliative care can continue on even after a patient dies, really focused on supporting family uh, and loved ones uh, with bereavement services. So ultimately then, the real model, the current model for palliative care is one of co-management or concurrent care. So that palliative care clinicians initially focus on symptom management and may ultimately get involved in end-of-life care planning with patients. But palliative care is happening along with curative attempts. The oncologists are typically focused on the management of the medical and surgical issues around the cancer. And at the same time, the palliative care team is focused on well-being and quality of life. So that co-management, different clinicians working on different problems, coordinated with each other, but working on different problems at the same time to really address all the issues that patients and families face in the setting of their GU cancer. Where I work is called the Symptom Management Service. We started this a number of years ago 
one of the early leaders in palliative care in cancer centers, one of the first outpatient palliative care services in a cancer center. We actually started in GU Oncology. Peter Carroll and other clinicians in GU Oncology recognized that if palliative care had something good to offer their patients, they wanted it for the GU Oncology patients. And so we were really first welcomed into the Cancer Center at UCSF by GU Oncology and have since spread across the Cancer Center and really serve patients with diseases of all different types from all different programs. Since 2008, we've been available to patients throughout the Cancer Center. Uh, but our, our original home and our heart will always be uh, with GU Oncology. So let me turn to the question of need. What's the need for palliative care? Why do we have palliative care? Why should we be focusing on it, thinking about it? Well, there's, there's two major reasons. The first one is really a should, and the second one is really a supposed to. As we, the first point is about the fact that since patients and families suffer or deal with stress from serious illness and at the end of life, we should be providing palliative care. Because there is burden, we should be providing a service that helps ameliorate some of those burdens. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, and then we'll get to the second, the supposed to part of why we need palliative care. But let's talk about the burdens of GU cancer. First of all, we can start with the physical domain, uh, pain, fatigue, bowel and bladder dysfunction, sexual functioning, are common symptoms, physical symptoms, that come along with GU cancers of various types. And it's important to remember, especially with certain types of GU cancer, that these symptoms may come from the disease itself, but often they can come from the treatment as well. And so when we think about helping people manage their cancer, we're not just talking about managing the symptoms from the disease, but also thinking about how to manage the burdens of the treatment itself, the side effects from the treatment. In addition to physical symptomatology, there is emotional distress, depression, and anxiety are common. I'll show you some data about that. In GU cancers, clearly there's spiritual distress. There's issues about identity. Who are you if you have a bag to collect your urine rather than urinating normally? Who are you if you've lost your sexual functioning? Who are you if your future is in doubt? And importantly, um, a lot of GU cancers involve threats to people's sexual functioning, their sexual identity, um, which in some ways is a spiritual distress as well. Caregivers as well face a lot of morbidity, a lot of distress around GU cancers, both physical, emotional, and financial. So I want to talk about bladder cancer and prostate cancer as two examples. And we'll run through some of the symptomatology of bladder cancer and prostate cancer um, as an example of GU cancers and the need for palliative care. So to start off with prostate cancer, this is a good example of where people with localized disease rarely have too many symptoms. As a matter of fact, many men are asymptomatic when they develop or are diagnosed with prostate cancer. Ultimately, for many men with early stage disease, with localized disease just in the prostate itself, the symptoms that they deal with have to do with the ones that we create in the healthcare world. These are symptoms that are due to the treatment for prostate cancer. So a radical prostatectomy, medications to control prostate cancer can create these problems, incontinence, impotence, pain, which often comes with localized disease after a surgery to remove the prostate. Impaired quality of life, especially sexual and urinary functioning. Um, and even for men who've been cured of their prostate cancer, there's something called PSA anxiety, which is the worry that almost all men have when it's time for them to get their regular PSA check to see if the cancer has come back. Men with metastatic disease, metastatic prostate cancer, cancer that's spread outside of the prostate to other organs uh, and bones, um, suffer both from the disease as well as from treatment. So pain, especially from bony metastases, is very common. Fatigue, common with 
almost all cancers, hot flashes, often from the treatment that we give androgen deprivation for metastatic cancer. ED is erectile dysfunction, impaired quality of life, Depression estimated to occur in perhaps half or more of men with metastatic prostate cancer, anxiety. And there's little research about the spiritual issues and the intimacy issues around metastatic prostate cancer. This is data from our program, the Symptom Management Service here at UCSF, looking at a subset of our referrals during a period of time a couple of years ago. The red bars are the official reasons for the referral that we heard from the GU oncologists or GU radiation oncologists, um, the GU surgeons. The reason people were referring their patients to the symptom management service for palliative care. And you can see the number one reason that people were referred was depression, if we look at that red line. The number two reason was pain. So pain and depression are the most common reasons that clinicians refer patients to the symptom management service for palliative care. But we've also documented what issues the palliative care team identifies when patients first come to see us. And you can see that we identify a whole lot of other symptomatology um, that isn't necessarily limited to depression and pain. And in fact, the number one reason why we see people needing palliative care in the very beginning is non-pain symptoms, very often fatigue. That's often the most common symptom that patients with cancer are facing. Uh, but we tend to uncover a lot of other symptoms and issues for patients after they've been referred to us. Our own data about the prevalence in the symptom management service here at UCSF uh, for men with prostate cancer um, shows that there are a number of things that are quite common. As we pointed out, depression is common. Anxiety, probably even more common than depression. Sexuality concerns, um, common. Pain, common. But now I can point out some distinctions between these two bars. The red bar is for men with localized disease, and the orange bar is for those with metastatic disease. So if we look at the question of sexual concerns, Men with localized disease are much more likely to express concerns about their sexuality than men with metastatic disease. Men with metastatic disease are much more likely than men with localized disease to complain of pain. Interestingly, mortality concerns are quite common, quite frequent among all men with prostate cancer. Mortality concerns are more common among men with metastatic disease, that orange bar, but more than 40% of men with localized disease who we have a reasonable hope of being able to cure from their cancer are still worried about dying from it. And it's really an old saw in my mind that anyone who walks through the doors of a cancer center has concerns about dying from cancer because we've very much in our society, in our culture, made an association in our minds between cancer and death. And of course, cancer isn't the number one cause of death in the United States cardiovascular diseases, but still, when we hear the word cancer, we worry about death. So there's a little bit of data um, about prostate cancer, but even less data about bladder cancer. We really know very little about the symptomatology of people, men and women, facing bladder cancer. We know that bleeding, pain, painful urination, dysuria, and urinary obstruction are common problems with bladder cancer. Depression and anxiety, again, very, very common. Some research that we've just completed showed that cystectomy, essentially removing the bladder to treat and hopefully cure bladder cancer, didn't actually end up improving pre-surgery symptoms for fatigue, depression, and anxiety, and may have even worsened other symptoms. So bladder cancer is an example where people may have symptoms from their cancer our treatment, which may work well to cure the cancer, actually may make them feel worse. So you might be cured, but postoperatively you may feel worse for at least six months. So we have a number of reasons why palliative care is appropriate for people with GU cancers because of the burden of disease and treatment. There's also formal recommendations from powerful bodies and professional organizations that say 
we really should be providing palliative care, that palliative care is a requirement for people facing cancer. So ASCO is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. It's the major cancer organization in the United States. And ASCO has come out very, very strongly in support of palliative care for all patients with cancer who have metastatic disease or, and or a high symptom burden. So ASCO is really, really strongly recommended that all patients with cancer who have serious illness get palliative care, along with, concurrent with their cancer care. So ASCO now really believes that the routine for cancer care in the United States should be a combination of oncologic care, cancer care, and palliative care together. The Commission on Cancer, many of you probably won't have heard about, uh, but it's actually quite a powerful organization that certifies all the cancer centers across the country other than the major academic ones like UCSF and others uh, that are NCI designated. But cancer centers that are certified in the community um, are under the auspices of the Commission on Cancer. And they, a couple of years ago, came out with their recommendation, their requirement that palliative care services are available to patients either on site or by referral, period. So people who take care of patients with cancer need to be able to offer palliative care. The American Neurological Association recommends palliative care for some patients with advanced prostate cancer, but doesn't really say very much about it and doesn't say anything about bladder cancer. So the American Neurological Association is really just at the beginning of, I think, understanding the real role of palliative care in GU cancers. So we need palliative care because big organizations say we need to provide it, but we mostly need palliative care because people suffer from cancer, GU cancers, and its treatment. Well, fair enough. What does palliative care offer you? If it's clear that we have needs that need to be addressed, is palliative care the service that can do it? So let me run through some of the data that we have about the benefits of palliative care. So, I'll start off really with a little bit of a, of a caveat about palliative care. I told you that palliative care and curative care, curative attempts, work together concurrently in co-managing disease and co-managing illness with patients. And I would start off talking about the benefits of palliative care by recognizing that if we can get to the root of the problem with curative care, if we can treat cancer, make cancer go away, if we can cure cancer, that's probably the best palliative care you can get. If you can make people better and cure their cancer, and the treatment isn't worse than the cure, that's a good thing. So there's excellent data to show that radiotherapy, radiation therapy, bisphosphonates, chemotherapy can have a palliative effect. Things that you get from your cancer doctor may actually help you feel better. So that's absolutely true. But palliative care has an important role. Often, treatments that we get from our cancer doctors don't help us feel better, at least in the short term. The data that we have for palliative care is really quite profound at this point. And I could really break it down into data about satisfaction, data about symptom burden, data about cost, and ultimately data about prolongation of life. So I'm going to run through each of these, noting to you that some of this data comes from geo-oncology, but the vast majority comes from cancer care generally with uh, patients with GU cancers included, uh, but not necessarily isolated uh, in separate uh, data reports. So to start off with, number one, improved satisfaction. Study after study, and our own data here at UCSF supports the recognition that people like that extra layer of support. People like palliative care. They're highly satisfied with palliative care, both patients and family caregivers. And why shouldn't they be? There's a specialized team of experts really focusing in on helping them live as well as they can with their cancer. Yeah. It's interesting to note also that clinicians, physicians, nurses, and other clinicians who do palliative care are highly satisfied with it as well. Um, so it's a good thing all around. We have some data. Uh, from our own practice, the symptom management service here at UCSF, um, that showed that uh, 
patients were very satisfied with the symptom management service, um, very comfortable with their visits, very likely to recommend the service to their friends, um, very likely to recommend the university, UCSF, because of the service. It's really a gold star or a feather in our cap to have good palliative care here at UCSF. Um, and a sense that the SMS improved their access to UCSF. A uh, major question, major issue for anyone who's tried to call to find an answer quickly on the phone, um, having someone answer the phone like we do in the SMS can be a huge, huge benefit. So people are satisfied, people like palliative care, and for good reason, because palliative care helps people feel better. Study after study that we've done over many, many years, including a few major studies done here at UCSF, have proven, I think, beyond a reasonable doubt that palliative care helps improve patients' symptoms. Most of this data comes from cancer patients looking before and after palliative care, what was the level of pain people had, what was the level of anxiety. And we've shown over and over again in these pre-post studies, but also in better done controlled trials, <coughs> That palliative care improves pain, fatigue, nausea, depression, anxiety, drowsiness, appetite, dyspnea, shortness of breath, insomnia, constipation, and satisfaction. Yeah? So palliative care is good for what ails you. It helps people feel better, especially in terms of the things that people are either most scared about with cancer, pain, or most commonly complain of, fatigue. Palliative care helps improve those symptoms. We have some prostate cancer specific data that came out of MD Anderson that showed essentially the same thing, that the symptoms were improved in a pre-post study using palliative care on top of routine care for prostate cancer. Here's the UCSF data published in another uh, paper. This data includes all comers, people seen in the SMS. It actually represents about 20% of uh, patients who had prostate cancer in this particular data set. And you can see the same thing that I've been showing you in the last couple of slides, which is when you look at these outcomes, you can see um, the pre versus post that symptoms get better. That the, the light gray bar is lower than the initial bar. So after palliative care, everything gets better. Pain, fatigue, depression, anxiety. The one thing that got better but wasn't statistically significant in our, significant in our study was nausea, probably because I think oncologists themselves do a pretty good job taking care of nausea. We look at quality of life, it moved in the right direction as well. It got better significantly. And uh, when we looked at well-being again, it got better. It improved. So our data here, like all the other data nationally, shows that palliative care improves symptoms. We looked at our data over a, a very long period of time to see what happened over time. Maybe these benefits went away. But in fact, we showed that um, at a second follow-up visit, the symptoms that improved stayed improved, and people got um, additional benefit over time from ongoing palliative care. And that it didn't really matter if you were a man or woman, what age you are, what ethnicity you were, what disease you had, how progressed your disease was, and whether or not you were receiving cancer treatments, all comers had improvements in their symptoms with palliative care. So palliative care, really a flexible service for any person who's dealing with symptoms. The benefits for palliative care in bladder cancer, again, an area that is less well studied than in prostate cancer, um, but in a study that we did, uh, here and just completed and are just working on the uh, paper for, um, we found that adding palliative care to routine cancer care for people with bladder cancer led to improved depression, anxiety, fatigue, quality of life, and what's called post-traumatic growth, the benefits that people get from facing cancer and growing kind of emotionally fr from that. So people like palliative care. They feel better with palliative care. As it turns out, people who get palliative care tend to utilize the healthcare system in a way that ends up saving money, meaning they tend to use the healthcare system in ways that are less expensive. They tend to go to the hospital less. The hospital is a very important place for us to have, but a very expensive place to get medical care. We 
we generally think about the hospital as the place you go when the right things didn't happen earlier, right, to try and prevent the exacerbation or the flare-up. So study um, that was done out at ND Anderson showed that if you got early palliative care, so palliative care more than about 90 days before you died, you tended to have fewer ER visits, hospitalizations, and you tended to die in the hospital less frequently, which is a good thing since most people don't want to die in the hospital. The data that we have that we're working on now has replicated this finding um, exactly, that people who get early palliative care um, have utilization that's sort of more appropriate. They spend less time in the hospital at the end of their days. We also know that even within the hospital, palliative care is associated with cost savings. This is a table that, or a graph that's very, very small. I don't expect anyone to try and read it. Please don't. But just to look at the general trend showing that the dark bars, which represent um, the cost for people getting interdisciplinary palliative care team attention are always lower and significantly lower than the light gray bars, which is usual care in the hospital. So essentially what this is sh showing us is that in every study that's done to date, inpatient palliative care, hospital-based palliative care consultation ends up leading to less costs spent in the hospital. Notably, people don't have worsened outcomes. They don't die faster or have worsened outcomes in the hospital, but they tend to seem to get better care and have less costs. The reason palliative care ends up being associated with less costs, and for sure, cost is not the goal here. We're not trying to save money on the backs of people facing serious illness. It turns out, though, that palliative care really distributes costs in a way that makes more sense. So in one study that was done at Harvard on patients with metastatic lung cancer, they showed that people who got palliative care along with their routine chemotherapy for their lung cancer ended up costing more than $2,000 less than people who got just cancer care itself. So adding this extra layer of support ended up not being more expensive. It ended up being less expensive when you look at the total cost of care, and that is because although palliative care increased some costs, meaning people ended up going into hospice earlier than they might have otherwise, and that increased the hospice cost, people tended to go to the hospital less commonly at the end of life, and people ended up getting chemotherapy in the last couple of weeks of life less commonly. So outcomes that most people say that they want at the last um, weeks of their life, not being in the hospital, not using fetal chemotherapy. Palliative care helped people achieve that, and as a result, there were cost savings associated with palliative care. Obviously, ultimately, for almost everybody, <coughs> survival, quality of life, but also quantity of life, is really, really at the core of what we want from our healthcare system. And we have some reasonable data to suggest that palliative care actually is associated with prolonged life. So adding this extra layer of support is actually a good thing. If you want to live as long as possible with your serious illness, adding palliative care to the curative attempts that you are pursuing makes sense. When people ask me, what can I do to live as long as absolutely possible Part of the answer has to be to pursue palliative care, to control your symptoms, to live as well as you can with the time that you have. So this data was um, a cohort study looking at some people who went into hospice with certain diseases and other people with those same diseases who didn't go into hospice, comparing who lived longer. And disease after disease after disease, folks who lived in hospice ended up living longer. That is, people who received hospice care, typically at home, ended up living longer. You can see people lived uh, more than a month longer in hospice with lung cancer than they did outside of hospice. And even prostate cancer, although it wasn't statistically significant, showed this trend towards living longer in hospice, a place where the focus was entirely on their comfort, than living outside of hospice, presumably trying to get curative ongoing curative attempts to control their cancer. 
But the best data we have came from that Temel study, that lung cancer study that was done at Harvard a couple of years ago. 151 patients with non-small cell lung cancer at Mass General Hospital, one of the teaching hospitals at Harvard University. And the study was comparing people who got immediate versus delayed palliative care along with their oncology care. So the people who got immediate palliative care met with their oncologist. They learned about their um, metastatic lung cancer. They started a plan for treatment of their metastatic lung cancer. And that very same day, they met with palliative care and continued meeting with both palliative care and oncology throughout their life. Those, people outcomes were, those people's outcomes were compared to folks who got delayed palliative care, meaning they got their cancer care for eight, nine months, and then at the very end of their life, they got referred to palliative care, which is how, unfortunately, it often is done. They got late palliative care. The people who got early palliative care, so that extra layer of support right from the very beginning, had improved quality of life, less depression. They got less chemotherapy in the last two weeks of life. They had fewer hospitalizations in the last month of life, which is what people wanted. But this was the real important finding, that the people who got early palliative care compared to the people who got late palliative care lived nearly three months longer. They lived longer. So they lived better, had better quality of life, better depression, less, less intensive, unnecessarily intensive care at the end of life, and they lived longer. So here's the take home point. That palliative care is an extra layer of support that helps people, at least some people, live longer with their cancer. So it's not an either or proposition anymore. It used to be we thought about quantity of life versus quality of life, and you had to decide between the two. But in the modern world now, with palliative care as we have it, it's quite clear that it's a both and world. It's not either or. That you get to pursue the longest life possible by having a mix, a combination, a concurrency of oncologic care and palliative care both. Three months longer is a long time in the world of cancer interventions. People who come up with blockbuster new drugs that make millions and billions of dollars are typically offering a week or two or three of added life statistically in the studies that they do. So to have three month longer survival with improved quality of life is a huge, huge benefit of palliative care. So let me uh, finish with the last sort of section of my talk, which is about the availability of palliative care. I, I presume I've convinced at least some of you that palliative care is a good thing, that if you have a serious illness, you need it. You should have it. It's good for you. It helps you feel better, makes you satisfied, helps you live longer. So yeah, you want it. Let's sign up for it. Let's talk then a little bit about is it available to you. So if you're starting a business or starting a movement or a specialty in medicine, this is the kind of bar graph you like to see. But over time, it just grows and grows and grows. And this is a graph demonstrating the prevalence of inpatient palliative care consult services. So palliative care consult services in hospitals in the United States. And you can see that back in 2000, we started off with 658, a relatively small proportion out of all the hospitals in the United States. But now, in 2014, we're up to about 90% of large hospitals have palliative care. So if you're at a large hospital in a metropolitan area in the United States, and you or a loved one gets admitted, you can almost for sure bank on the fact that there'll be some palliative care expertise there to help take care of you or your loved one. This is not distributed perfectly evenly. There's smaller hospitals, for-profit hospitals, hospitals in the southern United States uh, that are much less likely to have palliative care. But if you go to a large teaching hospital in particular, anywhere in the United States, you probably will get palliative care. We're approaching really good saturation in that field. As I hinted to earlier, outpatient, care is, outpatient palliative care is not such a rosy picture. And in fact, outpatient palliative care is not as available as inpatient palliative care. A study done a few years ago looking at cancer centers showed that if you were at a non-National cancer, cancer Institute designated cancer center, 
there was only about a fifth of a chance that outpatient palliative care would be available to you. So UCSF's outpatient palliative care program, the symptom management, started many, many years ago. We were one of the first. But unfortunately, we are not super common at this point. We still are relatively rare across the country, still relatively rare in the Bay Area to be able to offer outpatient palliative care. So we did a study looking at all the hospitals in California a couple of years ago who had inpatient palliative care services. And less than a fifth of them, so 18% of them, said that they also had affiliated outpatient services. So outpatient services are pretty darn rare still, unfortunately. And the ones that we do have are relatively small. On average, the California outpatient palliative care services that are affiliated with hospitals saw just under 160 new patients a year. That's not a lot of patients. They had just two people working, 2.1 full-time equivalents. And this is a problem if you're thinking about palliative care as addressing symptoms. The wait time for a new patient appointment was more than 10 days. So if you were in excruciating pain, 10 days is way too long of a time for you to wait. We can look at the numbers nationally for the folks who are certified in palliative care, hospice and palliative medicine. Physicians have now recognized palliative care as a formal subspecialty in medicine. So we're an official specialty approved in 2006 for a few years, for six years. People could get grandfathered into the field by saying that, well, they've been practicing palliative care, so they should be able to sit for the boards. But that grandfathering ended last year, or in 2012, and now you need to do a palliative care fellowship, at least a one-year formal training fellowship after your residency to be able to sit for the boards. Um, as of December last year, um, just over 6,500 physicians were certified in palliative medicine. So 6,500 physicians is actually not a lot. It'd be a lot if they were all in this room, but they're spread across the country. In California, we probably don't have enough palliative care physicians to staff even every hospital in the state. So this is a really small number compared to what we need. Nurses have a certification. Social workers have a certification. Chaplains have a couple certifications that are really just starting off. So one of the challenges is we just don't have enough people, enough experts to do the work. And here's why I say that. So if you have a heart attack anywhere in the United States, there's a good chance you're going to be able to find a cardiologist to help take care of you. It's estimated that there's one cardiologist for every 71 heart attacks that happen in the United States every year. There's one oncologist for every 145 patients who have cancer. Still a pretty good number. But there's only one palliative care doc for every 300 deaths in the United States. And if we look at serious illness, there's only one palliative care doc for every 1,300 patients who are facing serious illness in the US. So there aren't enough palliative care docs to go around. The gap is estimated to be somewhere between 6,000 and 18,000 physicians to staff just the hospitals and the hospices, let alone all the outpatient palliative care that you can imagine we need. So there's a huge gap in palliative care expertise available. So my takeaway points. Symptom management is needed because GU cancers create symptoms. Um, and importantly, because GU cancer treatments can create symptoms as well. Palliative care has benefits beyond just improving symptoms. So for sure, it helps improve symptoms, helps people feel better. But it also helps people live longer. Yeah? And cancer is not an either or proposition. It's a both and proposition. You don't have to accept harsh chemotherapy for the benefit of prolonging life and then suffer a terrible life because of that. Palliative care and oncologic care for GU cancers can work together to really provide the best care possible. Palliative care and cancer care working together. So it is a um, difficult thing to stand before you and say that nationally, 
for your friends and family outside of the Bay Area, outside of UCSF, it's going to be a little bit hard to find palliative care some of the time, especially in the outpatient world. But here at UCSF, um, I feel very lucky, very privileged that we have a very robust palliative care program and it's available to patients in our cancer center um, who want to avail themselves of the benefit. So let me stop there and thank everyone for your attention, obviously, and I'll look forward to questions and comments. No questions. I was just curious, talking about you earlier, but if a lot of the uh, prerequisites would be similar. So hospice, so palliative care doesn't have any prerequisites. Hospice care, you're right, did start early um, in the 1980s. It started by the British. So hospice itself um, in, the, in the world really started with Dame Cicely Saunders in England. Um, palliative care, uh, hospice care in the United States uh, became a benefit for Medicare, meaning you could use your Medicare dollars to pay for hospice as opposed to curative attempts when you were at the end of life. And you had um, at least one physician who would testify that he or she thought your prognosis was less than six months. That you had six months or less to live if your disease ran its course. So hospice very quickly and by structure and by design essentially became a program for end of life care for people who were at the end of life. And it was an either or program. It is an either or program that you gave up your Medicare insurance that might pay for chemotherapy and hospitalizations. You gave that up for your hospice benefit that would pay for a nurse to come to the home and a chaplain to come to the home and oxygen and medicines at the home. Yeah. It was mainly uh, using morphine and keeping people uh, comfortable rather than treating them in the hospice. So, right. So, hospice is palliative care focused for people who are in a particular situation at the end of life. So, anything that can help people feel better would be something that might be used in hospice. Opioids, like morphine is an opioid, a class of medicine. Very, very useful medicine. Yeah, um, I worked in hospice. Yeah. With HIV. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, but importantly, um, there are no prerequisites for palliative care. Essentially, what you need is a palliative care team that has capacity to see patients, and you need a clinician who thinks to refer the patient to palliative care. I think palliative care is used most effectively, most appropriately by people facing serious illness who have distress, symptoms, physical or emotional, um, or really want to have the benefit of thinking about their decisions out loud, um, really making sure that their values are incorporated into their health care plan. Yeah, the team approach, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions or, or comments? Yeah. Um, what factors do you attribute the prolonged life to? So it's a great question. So the study, although the association is very, very clear in the research, the mechanism for it we don't totally understand. There's at least two major explanations. One is that palliative care helps people live longer. The other is that hospitalizations and chemotherapy at the end of life cause people to die faster. And we really don't know which is true or what proportion of each uh, accounts for the truth. Um, but I think what we do end up finding, and I think people's experience in hospice um, resonates with this, um, that there is something about the idea that with limited energy, if you're spending it all on trips to the clinic and dealing with nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy, that that may really be sapping the resources, the precious limited resources that you have. And that if we really can focus on helping people feel better, they'll have a chance to use that energy to live longer. I mean, that's, that's my sort of unofficial uh, theory. I think that it is quite possible that um, we all have limited resources of various types. We have limited healthcare resources, we have limited psychic resources, limited physical resources, and spending them most appropriately makes the most sense. Um, in the hospital, it is possible that treatments that we do are accelerating 
people's dying, um, or at least putting a burden on them, uh, which is costly to them. It takes a lot of energy out of you to be sick, um, to have pain. Uh, for those of us in the room who've dealt with pain, you know that at the end of a day filled with pain and nausea, you are ready for bed early. It saps you. Um, and that may be a mechanism that's going on, but we don't fully understand uh, that benefit. I think even underneath that, without even understanding that, though, we can very much appreciate that um, palliative care's role includes helping people achieve uh, the kind of care and the tenor of care, the tone of care that's consistent with what their wishes are. So if you want to be in the hospital, in the ICU, in your last days, palliative care would help identify that as a desire and a goal and a value and help implement that plan. If you want to die at home you know, with your favorite music playing or in a chaise lounge out in your backyard, palliative care will help you do that. So palliative care isn't necessarily committed to any particular kind of healthcare utilization. It's really committed to the principle that people have a right to get the kind of care that they want. And so even not knowing what the outcomes might be of these various choices uh, or affiliated with these choices, we know that it might be very useful for people to get the kind of care that they want. Well, with that, then, I will thank you all very much for your attention um, and look forward to any questions that you might have if you want to come up to the podium afterwards. Thanks very much.